I hate the UN. I mean, I, I really hate the UN. Bad, bad business. Bad for my business. I mean, we have had some small wars over the last 75 years. A few thousand killed, a few billions spent. But big wars, world war. Boys, a soldier could really get his teeth into nothing. And why? Because of the dang UN. That's why. Like, damn UN always keeping the peace, peacemaking negotiation. UN wants soldiers like me out of jobs. What you need is another war. Be careful what you wish for. Look, the number of wars and people killed by them is going up. And last year saw the biggest increase in military spending in a decade. Good. Great for my business. No. It, it's terrible for business. Spending $6.5 billion on UN peacekeeping in nearly $2 trillion, 300 times more, preparing for wars that nobody wants, that's insane. Worse, China's rattling sabers over Taiwan again. The only remaining nuclear arms treaty between the USA and Russia runs out in February. We could be looking at another arms race. Come on, raise the hounds. An arms race is the best possible thing for my business, boy. But terrible for everyone else's security. Let, let's see what our UN 75th anniversary festival peace and security workshop came up with. There was a time when the UN insignia afforded people working for the UN some protection in the field, the way that the Red Cross symbol uh, should provide protection to humanitarian uh, workers of the, the Red Cross. Unfortunately, what we've seen is more and more situations, not just Iraq, uh, where the UN has become a, a, a target. Positive peace can be easily understood as a society that's free from the structural problems that would lead its citizens to resort to violent action. Or, in layman's terms, violence is rendered unnecessary because there are no issues to fight over. For example, if human rights are upheld, society's functioning well, and citizens are generally happy, a peaceful environment prospers naturally. I went back to East Timor last year for the 20th anniversary of the, the self-determination referendum, and I'd had the privilege of heading the mission that ran that referendum. Um, and in East Timor, Timor-Leste as it is today, the UN is viewed extremely positively, um, particularly because of its role in uh, enabling the independence vote in very difficult circum security circumstances, also because of the role that Sergio Vera de Mello played as transitional administrator in the immediate transition to uh, self-government uh, after the independence vote. So. There are places where uh, the role the UN has played is, is recognized and positively recognized. <laughs> East Timor. <laughs> the UN is popular in East Timor. You can have East Timor. Just leave me the big, serious countries. Nobody loves the UN there. The people love military, parades, army bands. All the ladies love a soldier. They hate the UN, okay? Hell, most of the big countries are always late paying the UN with their Jews. They ain't even got a leg to stand on. No, my friend, y'all UN is over. You're right. Now is a challenging time for the UN, but the UN does much more than peacekeeping. 100 million people will go to bed tonight with food in their bellies because of the UN's World Food Program. Well, maybe the UN can find a role in the Army Catering Corps. We need some good cooks. But our food systems are under threat as well. Right now, we're failing to feed 7 billion people. And by the end of this century, we'll need to feed 10 billion. Let's see what our food security workshop came up with to deal with that. If current trends continue, we will need to have 42% more land by 2050 in order to produce our food. And by all good estimates, there is no new land available. And the reason why we need to do that is because the diet that we currently consume, um, which is high in animal products, takes a lot of land to produce. 
So we've all heard about the kind of land impacts of beef, but even chicken, you wouldn't think that it takes that much land to grow chicken. But actually, when you consider the grain that it takes to feed the chicken and the land it takes to grow that grain, then suddenly that land footprint becomes much, much bigger. Our food system not only affects us every time we eat, every single day, and when we sit around the table with whoever we sit around, whether it's our family or our community or, or sitting on our own, it also affects our whole future. You know, it's an absolute foundational part of the planetary crisis we're facing right now. And if we can't do something about reversing that, then we're reversing, you know, those nice dinners on the table for our grandchildren and their grandchildren and, and you know, the generations after that. So we've got to do something about it and people have to be educated about it and really act on it. Oh, oh so eating meat is a crime now. <laughs> you, you people. You know, you know, a soldier needs meat to fight. We need the protein. We can't, we can't get by on on salads and and muesli. <laughs> you may have to. Perhaps the biggest problem the world faces today is inequality. A tiny percentage living like you, with your meat, your cars, your foreign holidays, and the rest of the world barely getting by. Is that fair? Whoever said the world needs to be fair? <laughs> it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. And look, the military provides jobs. It puts food on my table. And look, what brought America out of the Great Depression? Second World War. <laughs> Millions of jobs spent making weapons, munitions, sending war bonds. Wars put food on the table. That's such rubbish. War is the worst thing for any economy. I'm sure our economist security workshop didn't suggest war as a solution to youth unemployment. Let's see what they did come up with. The other issue is about, well, should we just do the universal basic income that's been talked about? And there's no doubt at all that you need social protection. That's absolutely clear. But again, what the young people have said to us in the surveys we're doing it's that it doesn't answer the question. We don't just want to get enough money to survive. We want to have meaning in our lives. We want to contribute to the community. We want to be seen as somebody having status. And actually work generally is the thing that actually gives you that positioning, really. But at the moment, we still have no really good understanding of how we create jobs well in those countries. Even the World Bank says probably only 400 million jobs could be created in the next 10 years. A billion need jobs. So what happens to the other 600 million? There is something we have to do, which is a big, big problem, which is to understand again that we are one globe and we were all in this together, not just COVID, but climate change and everything else. The, the infrastructure of how we all work together across the world has never been more vital and it's never been more fragile. And I think one thing I'd really like to leave us all with today is the sense that uh, investing energy in the regimes and the institutions that bind together underneath the umbrella of the UN is absolutely vital for all the challenges that we've talked about today. So a big job to be done, but I wouldn't be negative. I think those young people out there have got it and can get us there. Invest energy in the institutions that bind us together. That's what we need, my friend. Yeah, but... The UN is not going to create 400 million jobs, is it? Expanding the military industrial complex, giving America full system wide dominance, making America really well and truly great again, that will create jobs. Or kill them. What? Wars kill people, remember? A nuclear war could kill every living thing on the planet. Oh my God. It'll, it'll never come to that. Yeah, wars kill a few people. Yeah, okay. But remember the Spanish flu? Y'all know that Spanish flu killed more people than the First World War killed soldiers. And that was 50 million. The current pandemic is nowhere near that level. But Aren't you pleased that we have the UN agency coordinating all the best ideas on how to deal with this health emergency? Let's see what ideas came out of our health security workshop. We know that if people 
move early with prevention or early action or intervention. It pays off. It pays off for individuals, for communities, for nations and the world. It pays off for pandemics. It pays off for mental health and for physical disease. So we know that it can be done and it should be done. We've seen how telemedicine platforms can help access and indeed digital can leapfrog and complement other systems. We've talked about the, the benefits that can be had from learning from others. So the benefits of shared knowledge between countries. Um, often that can be forgotten in, we talked about medical education and how traditionally that focuses only on Western medical education, but talked about the benefits of learning from others on an international scale and the exchange of good practices between countries and setting standards like minimum safety standards for, for healthcare practices as well. This needs to start with good education in schools. Schools don't address infection and pandemic routinely. They don't address prevention of ill health, nor do they address mental health. We heard many examples locally of things that work and help people. And let me just pick up the friendship bench to support people with mental health problems and how in this time of a pandemic, it has been made digital so that the support and the help can be ongoing. Isn't that an inspiring story? Y'all think I'm mad, don't you? I think you're a bit mad, yes. To, to think that any of the most pressing problems of today can be solved by the military, your weapons are about as much use in solving those problems as a jackhammer would be to a watchmaker. Y'all talking about the environment, climate change and all that nonsense. Planting forests, why don't we pick some daisies, huh? That's not where power comes from. Power comes out of the barrel of a gun. The gun has no power over nature. The biggest battle we have to fight right now is to ensure we conserve a viable planet to pass on to our children and grandchildren. So why haven't you done it? Huh? Why haven't you done it yet? You greeny meeny patsies. You all been nominated for moaning on and on about the environment for these last 50 years. So why ain't you any closer to cracking the problem? Huh? Um, well, let's see if our environment security workshop answered that question. My question to the elder panel would be, why is it, do you think, that previous generations haven't cared as much as possibly they should have or haven't taken as much action as they should have in order to move us along to achieving a sustainable future. We haven't done enough because we haven't shifted the values of people. We've tried to make these environmental arguments work at a time when an awful lot of people were either ignorant or indifferent as to the state of the planet. We tried to do it during a period of capitalism, which was almost uniquely vicious in terms of extracting wealth from people, communities, and of course, the planet. Try to do it in such a way as not to engage people in deeper issues about the meaning of life and values and the relationship between ourselves and the natural world, et cetera, et cetera. So it is that values dimension now, which I think is going to come to the fore because you can't just argue this from a technocratic, technological point of view. We have to dig deep into what it is that makes life special for human beings and all human beings because we are of course talking about a just transition for the whole of humankind education is probably the biggest driver towards a green economy i think without educating young people not enough will be done and i think the burden of climate change will pass down to younger people so i think it's so important that we're educated sufficiently and accurately as well you know there's lots of news going around that isn't necessarily accurate so i think adequate education is really important so, there you have it. What we need is a new set of values. Values in education. I mean, that is what I fight for. Values, freedom, democracy, the rule of law. 
a clean environment, health, education, human rights for all? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That too. I don't think you're mad. The UN needs people like you. Really? <laughs> I, I mean, I'm just a grunt. <laughs> I'm just a grunt, me. <laughs> Take us two planks. <laughs> but I am loyal. I am courageous. And I'll follow orders to get the job done. We'll bet on that. And that's what the UN needs right now. Loyal, courageous, public servants leading a global army to save our planet and its precious resources for future generations. Will you join us? Global army? That, that, does, sound in, that does sound interesting, I must admit. A global army fighting for the future we want. Future we need to protect us and our values. Will you join my global army and fight for our future? Well, sure. I got my witness. So I say, sure, man. Thank you. I'm going to help. I'll help you out.